Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. We are dedicated to preparing you for the most fulfilling future possible, a career in the space industry. Now, not everyone will be traveling off-world, but it is incumbent upon all of us to understand the science and advocate for space exploration and colonization so that we can support those who do. Our Patreon page is live and we would like to personally thank scholar Wade Tyler for his generous contribution. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you can, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Terran Space Academy. We appreciate anything you can contribute, and as always, we want to hear from you. By providing us feedback, we can better prepare you for the future. Helium-4, or regular helium, was discovered in the spectrum of the sun by French astronomer Jules Janssen in 1868, but he thought it was sodium. In the same year, the English astronomer Norman Lockyer also noticed the line and recognized it as a new element. With some help from the chemist Edward Franklin, it was named Helios. Later, Helium-3 was first discovered in 1939 at the Cavendish Laboratory by Professor Oliphant, as described in our previous lecture, a neutronic fusion creating an artificial star. Astronaut Harrison Schmidt was a geologist sent on Apollo 17 to explore the moon. Someday, if things go properly, there will be a memorial right here at Camelot Crater. It was at this location that he gathered regolith samples that would turn out to be historic. The space industry has been held back by government neglect, but has now caught the attention of visionaries and entrepreneurs and will soon be a trillion dollar industry. Prepare yourself to be a part of this amazing future for humanity by studying the science of space exploration and colonization with us. All that being said, this is lesson three of our course on nuclear fusion. We have covered the basics of stellar fusion with the astrophysics of fusion and humanity's attempts to date to create fusion here on Earth by creating an artificial star. I am not counting the hydrogen bombs. Today we cover the importance of Helium-3 and how mining it on the moon will change the world as we know and advance humanity beyond our dreams. Helium-3 is an isotope of helium that is very rare on the Earth, but a considerable component of the sun's mass. The sun creates fusion by using the immense gravitational energy produced by its mass to hold hydrogen atoms in close proximity at incredible pressures and temperatures while maintaining a high density for long enough periods of time to allow quantum tunneling to occur. As we see here from our previous lectures, the astrophysics of fusion and creating an artificial star. The quantum tunneling allows us to get around the long range electromagnetic force so that the much more powerful but very short range strong nuclear force can take over. Once the probability cloud of the nucleons in the nuclei allow them to appear close enough to each other to exchange gluons, they are slammed together by the strong nuclear force, bypassing the electromagnetic force and giving off energy. Looking again at our diagram, we see that as the strong nuclear force mediated by gluons binds the quarks and two different protons together, creating first a diproton with the release of some energy. In the diproton, a proton will sometimes decay into a neutron, creating deuterium. The deuterium fuses with another proton, creating helium-3. Then two helium-3 will sometimes fuse into helium-4, ejecting two protons. Not all helium-3 is fused, however. The solar wind ejects a massive amount of hydrogen, helium-3, and helium-4 away from the sun. These winds strike the moon, which has no atmosphere or magnetic field to protect it. The atoms of these elements embed themselves into the regolith of the surface of the moon. The moon rotates at the same rate that it orbits the Earth, about every 27.32 days relative to the stars and every 29.53 days relative to the sun. The moon also keeps one side facing the Earth as it has become tidally locked to the Earth over time. The moon takes 27 Earth days, 7 hours, 43 minutes and 12 seconds to complete one full orbit of the Earth. All this creates an average day. If you were on the moon, of 29 days, 12 hours, and 44 minutes from dawn to dawn. This all seems very confusing, but just remember that this gives 14.77 days of daylight, which I suggest we call a day loon, with an equal period of darkness, and let's call that a dark loon. 
This means the surface of the moon gets pummeled by solar radiation with protons, helium-3 and helium-4, penetrating into the lunar regolith. This solar radiation creates a considerable amount of secondary radiation, including neutron radiation, that must be considered as we explore and colonize the moon. But this means that helium-3, embedded in the surface, can be mined by processing the regolith. All we have to do to process it is heat it to 700 degrees Celsius, and the helium will be freed. Let's look at how helium-3 can be extracted from the moon, how important it is to sustainable fusion, and what the future holds for this amazing resource. Sample 75501, taken from Camelot Crater, was labeled and placed with the other 100 plus kilograms of lunar soil and rock to be returned to the Earth on the Apollo 17 mission. Over the next years, these samples were studied at universities all over the world. Young engineers at the University of Wisconsin found the sample to have relatively large amounts of the isotope helium-3 in 1985. This discovery has profound consequences for the survival of humanity. Helium-3 is, again, a rare isotope of helium, almost impossible to find on Earth. We have small samples from the nuclear decay of tritium, but tritium must be made in nuclear reactors. Tritium is one of the most expensive materials on Earth by weight. One kilogram costs $30 million, as it is unstable and cannot be stored for very long. Helium-3 is the only stable element with more protons than neutrons and can be stored and it costs only $1,400,000 per kilogram. 100 kilograms of helium-3 could power a 1 gigawatt electric power plant for one year if fused with the easily obtained isotope deuterium. The average family in the United States uses 10,972 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. That's almost 2.5 tons of coal per family at 2,460 kilowatt hours of electricity generated per ton of coal. 100 kilograms of helium-3 would produce as much energy as 3,560,976 tons of coal. The reduction in carbon emissions would be enormous. A ton of coal produces about 1.9 tons of carbon dioxide. How is this possible? Remember that coal is almost pure carbon and it combines with oxygen in the air as it is burned. The weight of the oxygen and carbon is higher than the weight of the coal itself. This example would save about 6,675,854 tons of carbon dioxide from getting into our atmosphere, and also 17.8 tons of radioactive uranium and thorium that we breathe. That's right, coal power plants put more radiation into the air than nuclear power plants would ever be allowed to, and we breathe these alpha-emitting elements into our lungs. So why don't we use helium-3 now? At $30 million per kilogram, we would need $3 billion to buy our 100 kilograms of helium-3. The equivalent cost of the coal would be only $185 million. So using helium-3 would be 16 times more expensive than using coal. How can we get more helium-3 at a better price? Not from tritium, but the universe has done us a kindness by depositing not just 100 million to 1 billion metric tons of water, but also 1,100,000 metric tons of helium-3 at least on the moon. Now, 25 tons of helium-3 could power the entire United States for a year. Plus, you would no longer have CO2 going into the air to produce most of our power. Sea level rise will flood trillions of dollars of property, and this threat would be reduced. We could all go to electric cars. They're really nice these days anyway. Plus, we'll all live longer not breathing uranium and thorium. But what would helium-3 mean for space exploration and colonization? It means you could take one ton of helium-3 to Mars and power a colony with a million people for decades. It means your ship could produce tremendous amounts of power and get you to Mars in a month rather than eight months. It would mean single stage to orbit ships with lots of Delta V left over. Let's look at how we can go about mining helium-3 and what it would take to build a reactor to use it. The entire lunar surface has absorbed helium-3. It impacts the lunar surface from the solar winds and gets soaked in. It is replenished every time the moon rotates, so about every 27.5 Earth days. A harvester working during sun loon could use solar energy to scoop up tons of regolith from the surface. The regolith would be put into a furnace chamber where concentrated solar energy from focusing mirrors would heat the regolith. The University of Wisconsin has been kind enough to design a lunar helium-3 mining vehicle for us. The latest iteration I can find is called the Mark IV and looks something like this. 
This device will have a mass of 18 tons. It will need about 350 kilowatts of electricity to operate. It can excavate up to 1,258 tons of regolith per hour, going down to a depth of up to 3 meters, and process 556 tons of the regolith per hour as it goes, moving at a speed of 23 meters per hour. Heating the lunar regolith to 700 Celsius would release the volatile gases, including helium-3, that have become embedded in the surface of the moon. When you cool the resulting gases, everything will condense out into a liquid except the helium. The boiling point of liquid helium is 4.22 Kelvin. You will not see this temperature almost anywhere outside of a laboratory. This allows for easy separation of the helium from other volatiles. For every ton of regolith mined, the processor will extract about 43 grams of hydrogen, 4 grams of nitrogen, 11 grams of methane, 13.5 grams of carbon monoxide, and 12 grams of carbon dioxide. Every kilogram we take to space costs us thousands of dollars to get to low Earth orbit. These extra materials would be vital to maintaining a viable colony on the moon. These byproducts of helium-3 extraction are very valuable. Hydrogen gas can be used for rocket fuel. Water is, of course, important to everyone. Carbon dioxide, which when combined with hydrogen gas through the Sabatier reaction, as described in the course on understanding fuel cells and power systems, can produce methane and methane itself. Methane is, of course, what the Starship uses. Elon Musk plans to colonize Mars. Let's help him by colonizing the moon, extracting helium-3 to save the Earth, then sending the methane found and produced on the moon to low Earth orbit to refuel starships for their trips to Mars. The carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide could be combined with hydrogen to make more methane, about 25.7 grams per ton by my calculations. Feel free to double check me on this. This would give us about 36.7 grams of methane per ton of regolith processed. At 556 tons per hour, that would mean 20 kilograms of methane per hour could be produced, about half a ton of methane per day. This is a lot more efficient than launching eight starships to refuel one for the Mars journey. The nitrogen will be needed on Mars and the moon to fertilize plants. The helium-4 can be used as a pressurant for pressure-fed rockets and as a coolant for superconducting magnets when liquefied. It would make no sense to lift these materials out of Earth's gravity well if they are available on the moon, where a simple magnetic catapult could put them in orbit for use in space. Only helium-3 would be valuable enough to return to Earth. Now that we have a mining operation going with a fleet of these machines processing away, how do you build a helium-3 reactor? Helium is extremely easy to turn into a plasma. Once the gas is a plasma, it can be accelerated with electromagnetic fields. But how can we ever hope to reach enough pressure with a high enough temperature, with a sufficient containment time, to produce power. Now, in some ways, this has been done for a long time. There are many tricks that scientists have used in the past to reach extreme density and temperature. They get a ball of plutonium to reach critical mass by putting explosives around it in a near-perfect sphere and detonating it. The plutonium is compressed and reaches critical mass. The explosion that is triggered can then trigger fusion in a thermonuclear device or hydrogen bomb though they are actually tritium and deuterium bombs. This brief but extreme implosion is the concept behind the pistons, lasers, and ion beams seen in the last lecture shown here. We need to look now at Professor Gerald Kolchinsky of the University of Wisconsin. He believes that helium-3 could be the answer to the world's energy and climate change problems. His lab is the only one on Earth that has built a practical functioning helium-3 reactor as a proof of concept, not to produce power. He did not build a massive tokamak, but instead is using a powerful electrostatic field to contain and concentrate the plasma instead of an electromagnetic field. Understanding the difference between electromagnetic and electrostatic fields can be difficult. Think of a battery with its negative lead running to one metal plate and the positive to another. The electrons in the battery are trying to get from the negative side to the positive side. This is an electrostatic field. A difference between electrical potentials that creates an electric gradient between two or more points. If these plates get close enough, the electrons might be able to force their way through the air, creating an arc. If they are kept just a little further apart than this, any charged particle traveling between the plates would be pulled toward one plate and away from the other, causing it to travel in a curved path. This effect has been used by particle physicists for over a hundred years to study the mass and charge of particles in cloud chambers. If you know the strength and polarity of the electrostatic field and you see a particle curve toward the positive side, you know it has a negative charge. Since a less massive particle will curve more than a more massive one, 
We can calculate the mass of an unknown particle by comparing its curve path to that of a known particle. If a particle curves at half the rate of a proton, it should have twice the mass, either a diproton or a deuterium nucleus. This is how the antimatter particle called a positron was found. It curved just like an electron, but in the opposite direction. Same mass, opposite charge. An anti-electron is predicted by theoretical physicists. Putting a charged particle in an electrostatic field is like putting a cannonball on a ramp. It will move down. The particle will move in the opposite charge direction. The steepness of the ramp is like the electrostatic charge difference. So if I have a device that has ionized helium nuclei in the center and I want to contain it, I put a large positive electrostatic charge on the walls of the device. The positive nuclei will be pushed away from the walls into the center. Dr. Kolchinsky's reactor creates a 10 centimeter in diameter spherical plasma that is compressed and contained by the electrostatic field. It can produce fusion at a rate of 200 million reactions per second, producing a milliwatt of power to run the reactor. It has not yet produced more power than it needs to run, but it isn't designed to. Firing this thing up is unbelievably expensive. Now helium-3 to helium-3 fusion is different than tritium-deuterium fusion because, as you recall, helium-3 fusion creates helium-4 and two high-speed protons. Since protons have a positive charge and a moving electrical charge creates a magnetic field, if these run next to a wire, they will cause the electrons in the wire to move and create a current. You don't need steam boilers and turbines to get power from this device. It can be made simpler and smaller than other fusion concepts. Professor Kolchinsky's graduate students are working on a solid state device to capture these protons and create direct electrical energy. Professor Kolchinsky believes that progress would be much faster if investors and companies took the long view. Not funding anything that can't be profitable in five years is truly short-sighted. One of the main difficulties in getting funding for his lab has been the distrust between NASA and the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy does not want to fund research if it doesn't have helium-3 available. NASA cannot guarantee any timeline at all to start mining helium-3 on the moon because it is at the mercy of political interests and funding. I know many of you love technology and hate politics. I do too. But the fact is that all groundbreaking research needs funding or it stays on the drawing board. Electric cars were invented at the same time as petroleum cars. Electric cars traveled through cities in 1905. But funding was available to develop the gas-powered cars from wealthy companies and individuals that owned a lot of oil-rich land. There were no equivalent electron-rich investors for the electric cars. Elon Musk did not invent anything revolutionary when he started building Teslas. He just applied available technology to the problem of electrical transportation and then worked to improve that technology. He has done the same to rocket science. He did not build an earth-shattering pulsed neutron propulsion device. He used plain old RP-1 and off-the-shelf electronics, applying the speed and power of modern computers to the problem of relanding a rocket. To a degree, anyone could have done it. Anyone with enough money to blow up several rockets until you had success. The difference was that no one had bothered to do this. If you don't have your own money and go in front of investors, they don't want to hear that you are going to do something that has never been done before. Landing a massive rocket booster. They assume that it has not been done because it's impossible. Otherwise, someone else would have done it. This is a classic catch-22. No one tries because it must be impossible. It must be impossible because no one has done it. Plus the appeal to authority. The great NASA, who landed on the moon, looked at it and said it wasn't feasible. It probably wasn't when they looked at it with 1960s computers. That doesn't mean it's impossible with 2000s computers. Elon Musk proved that it was not. So someone with deep pockets, a nation or billionaire individual, we're looking at you Bezos, what's the deal? Are you serious about expanding humanity into space? You are the richest man on earth. But the third richest man is landing things this size from orbit, while you are landing things this size from suborbital space. You are working with the company that brought us the space launch system, which has been delayed again by the way, has no complete rocket, and has absorbed enough money to complete several fusion devices. The US government should give Professor Kolchinsky's group just 1% of what it has wasted so far on SLS. That would be $170 million. Or one of the space billionaires should do this. There are several, Mr. Bezos, Mr. Musk, and Dr. Asher Bailey. 
Dr. Asher Bailey is the leader of what is planned to be the first space nation, Asgardia. Many dream, but Dr. Asher Bailey is also a billionaire. If Dr. Asher Bailey or Mr. Bezos truly want to build a nation in space, they need to fund Professor Kolchinsky's helium-3 reactor. Put it on a proven rover design, launch it with a Falcon Heavy, and get it to the moon. Once there, it can process regolith and put the first neutronic fusion device on the moon. This entire mission could be done for probably $250 million. Helium-3 is the future of energy production for all humanity, and always will be, if no one invests the resources to develop it. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Patreon is active, and we appreciate any support you can offer. Stay safe.